Hi kids, it's Mark Miller. I'm here with Mads Torgerson, uh, the PM for uh, the C-Sharp language. Mads, how are you doing? Welcome to DevExpress TV. Doing great, thanks. Good. Um, well, you know, the big news coming out with uh, the next version of C-Sharp is the async keyword and the uh, the await keyword as well. Mm -hmm. um, we tell us a little bit about that. What, is, what are the benefits that it's going to give uh, the developers? Uh? Well, so, there for asynchronous programming, uh, asynchronous programming is the kind of thing you didn't know you needed until you really need it. Um, for um, ensuring responsiveness of uh, apps that um, you, know, you, you, you usually see hang because of network access or whatever. Right. Um, for uh, getting good scalability of server side things, middle middle tier stuff. Uh, asynchronous programming is really sort of the, the wh what the doctor orders for for these kinds of issues. Uh, the problem up until now is that asynchronous programming is a really difficult business. It's something that you need to right. be very, very smart to do. And um, I think it makes the, the code harder to read, too. Yeah, the code, it, it's not just getting it right that's hard. It's, it's yeah. the, the code just becomes unmanageable, unreadable, um, error-prone in various ways, repetitive often. Um, right. Like I, explicit error handling in multiple places where you just had implicit propagation in, in your normal synchronous flows and so on. I heard Anders use the phrase, it turns the code inside out, right? Yes. And, it, and I, I think that's a great description of it. It really does, right? You've got yes. your normal way of reading code, right? And then you get into asynchronous code, and you, you have to change your mindset almost, right, to it read is, it. Yeah, it is not just a figure of speech. You really literally have to turn it inside out. Yeah. And, um, and that's what the, the async features of C-Sharp and VB are for, therefore, allowing you to write code like you normally do, to describe your sequential flows of control the same way as you usually do without having to turn it inside out, yet get the, uh, the benefit of asynchronous programming. Right, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. The, 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 the conclusion I get when I look at this code, the code that has async keyword is, uh, the word that comes to my mind is elegance. Right, you have you have before the the before code is is kind of like you say it's like inside out, right? It's almost like a, a science fiction special effect, right? Here's yeah. my code just <laughs> yeah. splitting out, right, and the creature inside, you know, looking around, <laughs> and then afterwards you have this, you know, beautiful, you know, futuristic almost looking code, right? right? Uh, um, the 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 demo that Anders gave at PDC 2010, he he says, hey, let's you know what, let's uh, just stick a, a clock up on the title bar title bar, and he writes a couple lines of code to, to update the clock, and using the async for the method, it marks the method as async, he has the await call, and uh, uh, to, to wait a second, and then come back and, 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 and update it again. Right. And then he calls the, the method to update the clock from the very beginning, right? And that's it. That's yes. all it is. It's incredibly yes. simple code to add now a feature that doesn't suck up you know, all this processor time, right? Doesn't block any UI, right? So I, I find it incredibly elegant. And, and when I think about that, right, I think, okay, look, so, so C Sharp moving in this direction, right? What, do you, what, are your, what is your criteria? What is the team's criteria as you guys move forward? Is elegance a part of that? Are there other things? Um, well, elegance is certainly something we require of a feature before we want to put it in. Okay. We don't want to stick in something that's ugly. That's, right. <laughs> that's a basic sort of, um, um, it's a necessary but not sufficient requirement. Um, we generally, like, people may not think so, but we're actually extremely conservative about what we put into our languages. Um, we, there has to be a number of really, really good reasons to do so. Um, and that's it's sort of been the case uh, through the, the last this will be the third release where we are not changing the sort of fundamental language in major ways. We're, we're, we're putting in new features to sort of add additional capabilities as opposed to working in the, in the foundations. And, and the criteria really there has to be that what we put in has to be tremendously useful right now for people with uh, widespread common scenarios. Right. Right? People out there right now suffering because we don't have this feature. And that we can help. And then at the same time, it has to be a feature that we still want to wake up next to 20 years from now, so to speak. Uh, it has to have strategic value. It has to be right. general enough and at least, I mean, we can't know, but we, we ha have to have good reason to hope that it's so general and so um, um, widely applicable that it's still a nice thing to have in the language 20 years from now. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, tactic and strategic. Um, and then we have to, you know, there has to be a 
a big problem to solve, but there also has to be a good solution. And we'll work hard to find the, the, the elegant, brilliant solution to a given problem. There isn't always one. Like There's several things we've looked at where we're just like, hey, we'd really like to solve this, which don't have a, a grip on it. We're right. not smart enough or whatever. But this was one where we felt we were close enough that we, you know, the problem is really re there. It is growing bigger year over year right. uh, because uh, the most common course, course of hanging applications is, is network. And, you know, no app today with, you know, any self-respect doesn't have some kind of network activity. And so... Uh, you know, go a web app or whatever, and and so it's just becoming more and more important. Um, well, at but the same time, we know that there are ways we can address this. We know that um, from people having used iterators in C sharp to sort of half get there and so on. We know there are language solutions to this problem, and there are no good API only solutions. So we have to address this with language. We kind of know how. We just have to figure out the best, most elegant way of doing. It. So when you see a problem like this, like for example, you, the, the trending asynchronous problem, right, where it's getting bigger and bigger, do you, and you're, you're, you're thinking about solutions, is, is tooling also a part of that discussion? Do you think, do you, do you get together with the, the tooling portion of Visual Studio and say, well look, here we have this problem, and, and could we solve this maybe with, by adding tools to make it easier to yes. create this asynchronous kind of hookup code? That sort of thing. Has, was that actually considered for this, for example? Is that, um, was that something that... It was, uh, in a sense, yeah. I mean, we, we own the whole stack. We own the runtime. We own the, the languages on top. We own the tools that you work with the languages on as Microsoft. And that's very positive because that means when we, when we have a problem, we can address it where it's addressed best. And I think we realized pretty early on that this was not primarily um, one for the tools because the code that needs to be in place without changes to language or, or API is monstrous. And you could have a cool generated right. for you, but you still have monstrous code at the end of the day. Sure. So yes, it was considered early on and then pretty much um, dismissed as sort of the fun fundamental um, mode of addressing this problem. Now that said, once we've taken a language step here, there's plenty of tool level stuff you can do. Um, so we do address this both with in this case, we don't have any changes to the actual runtime, but we address it with a combination of framework and, and language and then tool features on top that, that smooth over any remaining sort of uh, rough edges in the experience. Right, so you're inter introducing, from, from our perspective, so, so we're writing Code Rush, right, which is uh, one of the things we do is we are understanding the source code. So from our perspective, the introduction of await and async is like you know, throwing a wrench in everything, right? We've got to yes. go through and now we have to, to re-understand what the code is. We have to change our parsers and, uh, the, and as, uh, in addition to that, our tools that work with that, like extract method, things like that, to understand what we're dealing with. And the same thing must have impacted you as well, right, yes. when you're working with tools. The idea of introducing a new keyword must have impact. There's always a huge downstream, if you will, mm -hmm. impact. Like the, the closer to the core we change something, the more things need to also change to, right. to catch up with that. So, so, so that's kind of, it's also kind of exciting, I think, in a way, right? You're saying, okay, look, we envision a, a more elegant, simpler way of doing something. It's going to take this much effort to come up with two simple keywords, yeah. right? I mean, it's, it's huge. It's like there's, there's tremendous dark magic in the background, right? When I do async and await, right? Things that are going on in the background with the compiler's building for me, it's huge, I think, if, from my mm -hmm. perspective, right? There's a lot of work you guys are doing right. to give us these two keywords to simplify everything. It's, it's fun how, yeah, it is. It's fun how what you see as a user is the tip of the iceberg, hopefully. If you see a whole bunch of complexity, it's because we didn't do enough work. We didn't do enough right. dark magic to right. to to uh, wrap it all nicely back up for you. Right? Right. Um, so definitely, a, a lot of work goes into it from our side to make it just a, a small, elegant feature. Um, yeah, that's that's that side to it, definitely. So speaking of which, speaking of wrapping these things up, one, uh, you know, I've noticed a, a, a trend. You know, you've got these, the auto-implemented properties, for example, which wrap up the complexity of, of, of doing this repetitive property declaration. And then you have the var keyword, right, which almost is saying, hey, you know what? We realize that you know, declaring generics is a lot of keystrokes, so let's make it simpler a little bit. It, it kind of seems like it's, the var keyword almost, I would categorize that as a Band-Aid almost as we're moving forward, right? Yeah. 
Um, and 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 so I'm 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 looking at that, and then you know one of the things I'm thinking about is uh, for WPF for creating dependency properties, it's this it's almost like a candidate for simplification again, right? You have you're introducing this framework, mm -hmm. right? That you're saying, hey, everybody, adopt this, but then you know the mechanics of adoption are. Are, are pretty verbose, right? There's yes. pretty. There's a lot that you have to do. Was that ever a candidate for discussion for auto-implemented dependency properties or, yeah. or something like that? Yeah, there's, there's definitely um, the WPF programming is it's such a it's such an expressive model mm -hmm. in the API, and um, it's hard to be concise at the language level about expressing that um, because of all the all the levers you have. Dependency right. properties aren't just properties. They're a thing on their they're own. They're things, right? Yeah, they're, um, they're, yeah. And it's one of those things that actually for multiple releases, <laughs> we've been sort of staring at it from different angles and trying to see if there's something we could do that would really shift, uh, that would make a, a sizable dent in the, in the burden that people tactically have with this particular framework and also have the strategic benefits of something that, you know, 20 years from now when people, you know, they might not be using WPF, I don't know right. if you should be saying this in public, but, you something know. Something else, um, WPF 4 or something like language that. Languages in some kind of 4D world that we can't even think about, and, and yet we still have something that at the language level is elegant and, and, right. and, and versatile. And the, the truth of the matter is we don't have a really good candidate feature. So this, this is one of those instances where the problem is definitely there. Um, the solution isn't quite there. We keep training on different ideas there, and, and one day we may come out with uh, Eureka. We have uh, we have the great thing that will make this all uh, just click together nicely. Yeah. We some of those things we keep training on for years and years and years until some constellation of good ideas and general progress in the area and so on just makes it all click, or maybe never does. So async is coming out sometime in the future. It's already available as a CTP right yeah. now. Um, you're getting pretty good feedback on it, I, I yeah. imagine, right so far. We're getting excellent feedback, actually. What what is yeah? I, I, it's it's beautiful. I I mean, I look at it and I and I really, you know, that the word elegant, the word beautiful comes back. Great. I think you guys did an amazing job at taking something that was mentally hard to grasp and just getting rid of it, right? You don't have that part. So I think, you know, I want to say totally congratulations. Cool. You know, before we end the interview, though, I want, to, I want to look a little bit forward in terms of what we can expect coming beyond async in future versions. What, what do you guys have in store for us? Right, so we're, we're looking at a couple of, we're looking at many different things, a couple of them we're public about. Um, async is sort of the more tactic of them. It's the next language feature that we're thinking about, essentially, big language feature. Um, and then beyond that, at a more long lead scale, uh, we've already for a couple of years been talking in public about um, the project that's now codenamed Rosling, compiler as a service we call it, which is for both C Sharp and VB, offer up the, the compiler's understanding of the code as an API essentially. So um, both syntactically and semantically, uh, you know, type analysis, binding, all that kind of stuff, give people access to the compiler's reasoning about the code so that it becomes easier for, uh, for um, third-party uh, vendors to, um, to provide specific tools that require such language understanding, like checking tools for your code or any kind of interactive thing that plugs into VS, something like that. So it's not directly language features. It is um, um, a facility for anyone who writes tools over, over the language. Right. So, so, I mean, essentially today, which you, you know better than most, um, everyone who does this have to reinvent the wheel pretty much from scratch. Um, and, and here we're, we're just r raising Saying, here's the, the level wheel. that you can, you can work on, yeah. and, and thereby lowering the, the barrier to entry significantly, and hopefully getting an ecosystem where people say, hey, I wrote this um, great highlighter that will show you where you... Um, where you could use link, or where um, you know you you uh, declare something that you know that that has a name that's almost the same as another one that you use here, or whatever. Like any kind of analysis, people want to do. Right. right. So, um, and it's also helping us actually because it's an opportunity for us. It's the tactic and the strategic again. It's the opportunity for us to rewrite our compiler code bases um, pretty much from scratch. Like we. We draw on our existing code bases a lot. They're old. They're written in C++ many years ago, and just you know, um, uh, patched onto ever since then. And to really get a good restructuring where we have, you know, a much more 
fundamental infrastructure that resembles the model that we can then expose in public through the API. So compiler as a service, that's going to, you, you see that being available for VB and C Sharp. What about the other languages? Do you see it being available for C++, for F Sharp? Um, it's, not, it's not part of the effort. F Sharp is already written in F Sharp. Um, that, that already, that helps some. Um, and it may make a similar effort, but not on the same timeline necessarily. Um, I don't know about C++. It's not something that we're sort of strategically doing for all our languages. It's not like a, a big, um, uh, all-encompassing push. It is specifically for C Sharp and VB. And the models that we do offer uh, are language specific. It's not like some kind of meta framework for all languages to fit I into. See. At least not in the first round. That's not sort of that's not really the scenario for it, right? Okay. Now. <laughs> that's awesome. Well Mads, thank you very much. Really Thanks. appreciate Thanks for it. Coming. Um async keyword. We can get the CTP now and try it out if we haven't done it yes, yet. Right? Get the CTP, try it out. Uh, be aware that it does not work well with the uh, beta of SP1. Right. So you either have the CTP which runs on top of um, of the RTM of VS 2010, or you have um, the beta of uh, SP1, but you don't have both. <laughs> okay. At some point, we'll hopefully um, be able to refresh the CTP to run on top of that. But good. All right. Good. Yeah, Go check. out there, uh, check it out, play it, with it, give it's us beautiful. more feedback. It's and, good. And help us get it right for whenever we, we get ready to release it. Mads, thank you so much. Cool. Thanks. All right.